So this past week, I had my birthday, and uh, did you ever see the show Hee Haw? Yeah. Well, my friend sent me and downloaded the song, Blew Me, Spare, and Agony on Me, Deep and Excessive Misery. You weren't for bad luck, I'd have what? No. Uh, he said I was at a certain age for my birthday, but I think he got me. He gets me. I turned that certain age. So, do you ever feel that, ever felt like nobody gets you? Um, have you ever felt that no one truly knows you, or better yet, gets you? You ever felt that way? Nobody understands where I'm going through. Nobody understands the situation in my life. I've said previously in a sermon about a month ago that all of us need probably a good listening to more than we need a good talking to. I'll say it again. All of us probably need someone to hear us out before someone needs to give us a lecture about life. You ever feel that nobody gets you? Uh, there's a song I enjoy uh, rather older song, but I would like this genre of music by Gilbert O'Sullivan. He's an Irish man, and you can sort of hear him cry out that nobody gets him. Let me go ahead and read the lyrics to you. I'm not going to sing them to you. To think that only yesterday I was cheerful, bright, and gay, looking forward to who would and who to who wouldn't do the role I was about to play. But as if to knock me down, reality came around without so much as a mere touch coming into little pieces. Leave me no doubt. Talk about God and his mercy. Oh, if he really does exist, why did he desert me? In my hour of need, I truly am indeed alone again naturally. And when we feel like nobody gets us, we feel very what? Alone. You just don't understand what I'm going through. You don't know what my life is presenting to me. Because nobody gets me. When nobody gets me, like him, I'm alone again naturally. I'm cut to pieces, and nobody gets what I'm going through. You ever felt that way? Well, I'm going to switch gears. I'll come back to that, I promise. Um, worldview. Now, worldview um, is a word. Uh, let me just we'll use this explanation. A worldview is how we answer the core questions regarding life and select options that seem reasonable, common, and comfortable from birth on. Everybody here has a worldview, how you look at the world. Everybody here does. Uh, even somebody who says, well, I don't have a worldview, you still have a worldview. Uh, when I gave this sermon last night, someone came up to me and said, there's a song he heard where someone says, I have no opinion, but even though you have no opinion, that's still an opinion. Everybody here has a worldview how you view the world. Uh, maybe you view the world that I'm here to have fun, and I'm here just to, to, to go about and enjoy life as much as I can, because when I die, I have a long dirt nap, and I get all the rest I need. Or maybe you view the world that the world's out to get you, and life has really sort of dumped on you, and I've always gotten a short in the stick. Everybody has a worldview, and from the time that we're born, that worldview gets shaped. And for many of us here, well, let me go ahead and pull this on. Um, for many of us here, we combine different elements of our life to our custom blend of how we have a philosophy of life. We, we take things we hear and know, and we have a philosophy of our worldview, and so I call it a what? A cup. Now, I don't like coffee, but there's custom blends, you know what I'm talking about? I like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And so we, we custom blend that, and that becomes our worldview. We pick things in our world that sort of defines who we are and what we really think about life. Um, our worldview is a patchwork of complementary and sometimes conflicting beliefs and behaviors. I had someone tell me, Pastor Muse, I just love St. John to death, even though I come to church once a year. Okay, somebody told me that. Or Pastor Muse, I think the Bible's the most important book in the world, but I haven't picked it up in five years. Okay, so sometimes our worldview is in conflict with what we do. There's conflicting behavior. I believe everyone should forgive, except when somebody hurts me that I can't forgive that person. What I'm trying to get at is everybody here, we have a worldview, how we view life. And that began forming from the time we're born, and for, it keeps on changing for some of us. For some of us, the better. For some of us, the worse. Maybe my worldview is I just want to have fun and want to live each day. Uh, somebody said that if you're a builder or a boomer, or Gen Xer, that you live to work. We like to work and have a nest egg. We enjoy retirement. And somebody said maybe the younger generations, like the millennial and the Gen Yers and whatever, the Gen Zers, that they, they work to live. I work so I have a couple bucks in my pocket. I, I buy a pizza until I'm going off for a beer. So people have a different worldview. But for us believers, but for us believers, a biblical worldview is this. In Christ alone, my hope is found in ancient words ever true. For us believers, we'll say my worldview is that I know Jesus died and rose for me. I'm going to heaven. And the Bible, the Bible's it. That, that's where I look for answers, look for hope, look for guidance. I find Jesus. And that's what a believer will say about their worldview. And that shapes 
their political opinions, and that shapes how we live life, and then that shapes my hope for the future. So I want to talk a little bit more about worldview. And so the biblical worldview, in a biblical worldview, people are more likely to what? If I have a biblical worldview, once again, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I believe what the Bible says, uh, they tend to believe their life is happy and fulfilled. I really don't need all this money. I don't need fame. I, I, don't, need, I don't need to have everyone love me. I don't need to be appreciated by everybody. That, 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 that's a biblical worldview. My life is happy and fulfilled. I, I have what I need. St. Paul says, with food and clothing we shall be content. In a biblical worldview, they have long-lasting, satisfied relationships and marriages. Religious people stay married much longer than non-married people. In fact, married, many Christian marriages will last until death do they part. Now, now we hear this, oh, by the way, Christians divorce just as much as non-Christians. That's not true. For devout Christians who worship and, and they, people would say, exercise their faith, they divorce a lot less. So in a biblical worldview, a lot more lasting marriages and relationships. In a biblical worldview, we serve others and forgive others. It is true today that on August 4th, 2024, conservative Christians out-volunteer and out-give all other sectors in society. There is no sector or group in society like conservative Christians who out-serve and out-give. I remember when Katrina took place in New Orleans, and it was about six months afterwards, and President Harrison went down there to visit, and he said a lot of people have left helping out, but it's the Christian groups that are still there supporting. So if I have a biblical worldview, I don't mind serving others and forgiving others, and have a clear sense of purpose. I know what my life is about. I have a purpose in my life. It's to serve God. I'm not like a ship floating out on sea. Now, if I don't have a godly worldview, which means... I'm not sure I buy into that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I'm not sure I really buy into the Bible. I just really have no godly worldview. My worldview is I enjoy each day. I take life as it takes it. My, my worldview is to have as much fun and pleasure as possible. If I have a godly worldview, what do we know? We know people are more depressed, they're more anxious, they're more fe fearful, and they have an increase in mental health issues. Now, this isn't church data. This is secular data. This is... Uh, like Gallup poll and other pollsters who say, this is how people without a biblical worldview, they deal with this more. Um, if I have a non-biblical worldview, 54% of millennials have no clear worldview. And we see that. You see it with church attendance. I'm not here to bash millennials, but they've never been given a worldview. Uh, friends in Christ, if there's one thing as a pastor that I'm around a lot, I'm around a lot of sick and death. Um, about sickness and death. Uh, many times I find myself in, in nursing homes or ICUs where a person's nearing death. And I shared this with you before. I'll share it with you again. In that, in that situation, I can tell the difference between believers and non-believers. Why? If there's a believer and their loved one's coming near death, there's still a peace among them. They can still handle it. They can still deal with it. There's not the hurt and the pain and the anguish. Uh, I was one time making a, a, a home, vi a shut-in visit on an elderly lady, and in the room right next to him, uh, she just died. And I, I met the family coming out and said, I'm very sorry. And I remember the one gentleman said, what are you sorry for? She's now with the Lord in peace. We've been waiting for this. For Christians, death comes, there's peace. For a non-Christian, there's a lot more hand-wringing. There's a lot more pain. I see it even at grave sites. F at a Christian funeral, we have the committal service. They go home. For a non-Christian burial, there's a lot of hanging out there. I'm not sure if I'll see this person again. So a biblical, non-biblical worldview, this is some of the stuff that we run into with that. So Israel, I'm going to go back to the text. Israel's in the wilderness, and they don't believe that God gets them anymore. And they lost their worldview. We, we forgot who we are. We forgot our worldview. And the other thing they're dealing with, they're dealing with hunger. You ever been hungry? Now, I'm not talking about your stomach's growling, you're starving. I'm talking about maybe you haven't had food the type you needed for a week or for two. Maybe you're in a service. Maybe you experienced poverty. And so they were really hungry, and this is what they said. Can you all read it with me? We lost our world worldview. God, why don't you just leave us there as slaves? Now somebody says, Pastor, how do you know the Lutheran religion's right? Well, there's more proof there. In the desert, the whole community began to what? Grumble. I know Lutherans, okay? 
All right, there's a Lutheran group. Never mind, okay. Some people are smiling. All right, thanks, okay. All right, and so uh, they lost a worldview. You and I sometimes can lose our worldview, and I, I too, because I tend to be materialistic too. If you live in America, you tend to be materialistic. Now, this is from a book, uh, The Story of Stuff, and this is called A Minimalistic View, a minimalist person who doesn't like a lot of stuff. So I want to talk about us here, 2024. American home sizes have tripled in the last 50 years. Last 50 years, the average American home is now three times as big. Less people, but more what? Space. We have spare bedrooms. We have spare space. The largest, fastest growing segment of American real estate is off-site storage spaces. Uh, even when my kids were at home, we had to rent storage space down the hill. Why do we need more storage space? Because we all have more what? And I don't know where to put it all. Okay? Talk about materialistic, materialism. American children, I think like American children compose 6% of the population, own 40% of the world's toys, and they own 238 of them. So I don't call it toys are we or toys are us, but toys are me. Okay? That's how many toys I have in a house, but they only play with how many? 12. I got 238. Okay? Uh, let's talk about this more. American homes have more TVs than people who live in them. If my game's not going the right way, my wife sometimes sends me upstairs to watch it upstairs. Or sometimes we have three TVs going on, even though there's two of us in our home. You know, you're going to turn off that TV? So we Americans, we have more TVs than we do people. Um, Americans donate 1.9%. By the way, what's a tithe? How many percent? Ten. That's true for Missouri Synod Lutherans, too. Other income, while 6 billion people make less than 13000 a year. Uh, if you work at McDonald's and you get paid twelve fifty an hour, you make $25,000 a year. Okay? If you just go to McDonald's and say, I'm just a newbie at McDonald's, you'll still make $25,000 a year. Okay? Talk about materialism. Let's do a few more. Shopping centers outnumber high schools. And Americans spend $100 billion more on shoes, jewelry, and watches than on higher education. Why well, can't find anyone to change my tires or to fix my housing plumbing? I can't find an electrician or someone to do some brickwork in my yard. Well, guess what? We have buy, spend more on shoes and jewelry and what, that stuff than we do higher education. I'm, not, I'm also talking trade schools. And so we, yet yeah, we Americans too, grumble, we're unhappy, and we say, what? No one gets me. But God does get us. He speaks to us. He says, I made you in my image. What does that mean? Well, we have a mind. We can reason. We can think. We feel. We want to be in relationship with God. We want to be in relationship with each other. We love. We care. We weep. We're intellectual. We have a spirit. Um, while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. I'm not sure what sin that you're involved with or I'm involved with. But while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he's a giver of all good things. And in that worldview... Thanks be to God, he gives us victory. So he gets us. So even when we grumble in our materialistic, all this materialistic stuff, we still have victory through Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to read this to you. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God, not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal flesh, so death is at work in us, but in life with you. <clears throat> what I'm trying to get at is that when you believe that nobody gets you, and where are the words being used? We're afflicted, we're perplexed, we're persecuted, we're struck down. God is still with us. Even though we feel that way, God still gets us and he's with us there. He uses that to build us up. Can I ask you, because somebody once asked me of this, let me ask you now, has God ever forsaken you? What's the answer? No, he's never forsaken you. He forsook Jesus on the cross when he turned his back on Jesus. My God, my God, why have you what? And he endured all the pains of hell and sin and death himself. He never forsook you and you, you and I. Even though those words afflicted, per, perplexed, and persecuted and struck down, he still gets us, he loves us, and he cares for us. So death is at work in us, but in life in you, he gets us. He understands us. He loves us. He redeems us. I made you in my image. I will feed you with my bread of life. God fed the hungry Israelites and opened heaven and fed them, and he gets us. 
That's how God feeds us. He's everything. Patient, kind, gracious. In all our dealings with his people, he is a God who does, did, and will do for all of us, for all of you. And by the way, what's our mission? Our mission is to display the godly worldview. Jesus died for me in the Bible's word of God. That's our mission, to display, to display, display that worldview. We display it in our Tiger's Den in preschool and school. We display it in our Sunday school and vacation Bible school and cross training. We display it in worship. We display it in our adult Bible studies. We, we display it in the food pantry, in the clothes closet, to display the worldview. What? Jesus died and rose for me in the Bible's his word. He gets us. He provides for us. He blesses us. So how about this for a closing thought? It'll wrap it up. Can you read it with me? The world seeks after wealth and all that mammon offers, yet never is content, though gold should fill its coffers. I have a higher good, content with it I'll be. My Jesus is my wealth. What is the world to me? And all God's people say,